So I had the nickname, drum roll please, drum roll this, all right. Thank you, all right. Heat seeking missile. Yeah, that's the nickname they gave me freshman year of soccer and I think it's because they couldn't think of anything else because I was that terrible and I really wasn't fast so I wasn't like a heat seeking missile but that's what they called me and so I'd have some of my friends uh, that would be like watching the games they'd be yelling let's go heat seeking missile like you know kick the ball whatever but anyways I tried soccer freshman year I missed so many wide open goals like you know like the like they call it a breakaway in soccer that's not what it's called right What's it called if it's like you and the goalie between the goal? No one else is there. Offsides, yeah, exactly. I, I also always got called for offsides. But like I missed so many like shots like on goal that like I never should have missed. Like I just had to you know, like tap men. I just like launch it over the goal. And um, basically soccer freshman year was just a, it was a complete fail for me. Have any of you guys ever failed at a sport that you did one year, right? Maybe it was swimming or soccer or volleyball or football. So that's what it was for me. And um, I didn't get better as the year went on. I still kicked the ball in the front of my foot instead of the side of my foot. And I was just not good. Um, but I went for it and I was like, let's do this, and I never played again, and the only soccer I've ever played is also intramurals indoor soccer, which actually is pretty fun if you haven't played that before in a gym like this. It's really fun, but soccer was the thing for me that I was like, I was in between. Like, at first, I was like, no way I'm gonna do this, and then when my friends kept like, come on, dude, just play with us, just be with the squad, whatever, um, I was kind of on the fence. Like, I was in the middle of just like, should I do it? I really don't want to but I feel like I should for my friends. I feel like I should give it a try or else I'll never be able to you know, say I tried it. Um, but, but all in all, I was on the fence about that. Like I was not all in for that sport. Have any of you guys ever played a sport um, over the course of many years and you played it just for fun, and, but you really were not playing it to be like the best on the team? Anybody? Okay, all right, I wish I could be like you. I'm way too competitive and not good at sports. Um, but like, so you know what I mean. Like if, if you do something, but you do it just to do it and you enjoy it, but maybe you're not all in like some of your teammates might be, right? They, they are more competitive or uh, they'll risk whatever, you know, injury and workouts and all that stuff. Like they're playing on AAU teams and whatever it is. I know there's lots of people in the room that do that type of, they do this, their sport, whatever their sport is, they do it year round. I talked to somebody today that is playing on like four different soccer teams and she's killing it. Um, you know who you are. But the, what, the point is uh, you, can, you can be all in for something and it be like, your sole focus. It'd be everything to you. And that's, soccer wasn't that for me. I was on the fence about it. I mean, I think even basketball, which was the sport that I loved, as I got into like junior, senior year, I think it became more on the fence for me too. I kind of lost my love for the game and I wasn't all in. And I don't know if you guys have had situations also in your life or in your faith where you had to make a decision, you had to, as, the, as they say, it draw a line in the sand and you had to say, oh, okay, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna be all in for this. I'm going for it. Or you were kind of right in the middle somewhere. You were on the fence. You just, you didn't have that commitment. You didn't have that drive. You weren't all in, all or nothing. Uh, we're doing a really short little mini series as we're gonna call it for two weeks, this week, next week. And uh, I got a shout out to Chaz who runs Everything Tech for us, Chaz, my boy, wherever you're at, is he up there or is he in the room? Chaz, is Chaz in here? There he is. Everybody, everybody say hi, Chaz. There he comes. Hi, yeah. So if you don't know Chaz, you need to get to know him. He's a great dude. He works on our staff. And he actually wrote this series for us. He wrote the outline. He wrote the, the, the meaning behind it. And so I want to read you guys something about this series that, that Chaz wrote that I believe is the heart of where we want to go. And it's called On the Fence. So, so here's kind of the summary of, of what we want you to know in this series. Our impact as a kingdom follower is dependent on how we view our life on this earth. Each person has the choice of what side of the fence they will choose to be on. The devil's plan is to keep us on his side of the fence. And if we cross over toward Jesus, the devil's plan is to keep us as close 
to being in the middle of that fence as possible. His strategy is to make us think horizontally instead of vertically. This perspective can cause us as followers of Jesus, if you've chosen to make Jesus your savior, not be able to focus on what has true heavenly value. The goal of this series is for each person to understand that you, you shouldn't see your life and your faith with a fence in the middle, with always having to decide, man, how am I gonna make this choice? How am I gonna be all in for Jesus? But instead, look at your life as a mission to let God use you in his kingdom. We have to eliminate our sight of being on the fence and instead see the ladder that goes to God. I really appreciate the heart that Chaz put into the vision behind this series. And so I hope you guys over the next 20 minutes and then in your groups will really get deep into this idea of our life and our faith being on the fence. Our goal in this series is for you to let God use you, for you to take that ladder to God and to not keep your life on the fence. I think one way that we began to live that out and, and, and have seen God begin to move is by shifting our focus in our ministry, high school, middle school, all across the board toward others. I mean, there's so many people in the room tonight that six months ago, you weren't here. Or six months ago, you might have said, yeah, I, went, I used to go to Eastside. I'd show up every once in a while on a Sunday night or Sunday morning, but you weren't invested. Our purpose as a student ministry is to be real, to be together, to seek the lost. We did that at Motion Night last, uh, last week. If you weren't here, we missed you, and we hope you'll be there uh, for the next one. Just a couple of quick things about Motion Night. We had over 220 students in the room worshiping God together. We had 27 people give their life to Jesus, many of which were high schoolers, in the water right over there. Actually, there's a group of guys that... Uh, uh, some senior and junior guys that, have a bas that had a basketball game today and some of those guys from our ministry gave their life to Jesus. I mean, it was crazy. Does anybody here know Hayden Darby? Anybody here know Hayden Darby? Okay, a few people. Dude was so pumped about giving his life to Jesus. He did the gritty right after he got out of the baptismal tank, guys. Whoever has that video, please send that to us. I think Tate might have that. But, but motion night was amazing. But again, kind of like Paul said in his communion, we can... We can have these experiences and these moments where it's like, oh my goodness, God's doing some amazing things. Oh man, I love my life group. Man, I got leaders that care about me. Motion and I was awesome. People giving their life to Jesus. I wanna take that next step. But then it can feel like a letdown the week after. Or, oh, you're back to reality, back in school, back in your job, back in that thing that frustrates you and you're back on the fence. In a moment, you can feel like you're all in. And then another, you feel like you've taken steps backwards and you're back on the fence. See, that's what the goal of Satan is in this world. He has dominion and power over this world. John 14, 30 says this. It says, I don't have much more time to talk to you. This is Jesus talking. It says, because the ruler of this world approaches he has no power over me. So Satan had no power over Jesus, but he is the ruler of this world. So everything in the world is on Satan's side. Every time I talk to a student, there's probably some of you in the room that I've talked to about this. When you make a decision to follow Jesus, you're saying, I'm, I'm leaving this life and having a new life with Jesus, and I'm leaving the old life and the old world behind. We have to do that as far as of Jesus. We have to actually decide to do that every day. That's why Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross every day, unless you deny yourself, die to yourself, it's not about you. It's not about me. Unless you do that every day, then you won't be his disciple. Because Satan has power and dominion over this world. I love what it says in, in, in Ephesians 6:12 about faith and about being on the fence. It says this, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I don't know about you, but I think at different times in my life, I have felt this fight. I felt this struggle that there's things that I can't maybe put words to or put my hands on that I know Satan is working 
behind the scenes. He's working through people in power. He's working through authorities. He's working in darkness. He's working through evil spirits. He's, Satan has so much dominion and power of this world because he wants to keep you on his side of the fence. That decision to go all in for Jesus. And what it's saying here is that, guys, our fight, it isn't just against the drama. It isn't just the, against the quarrels. It isn't just against, oh, this person said this to me or this person said this about me or this bad thing happened in my life. And because of that, like, it's my life's in shambles. Our problems, your struggles, the things that maybe you brought with you tonight that you're just like, man, I, I, th- th- this is my life. Satan is at work behind all of that. He's at work and he works through things that we can't see. He works through rulers, authorities, mighty powers in this dark world, evil spirits. Satan does that thing, does that because he wants us to keep us on that side of things. He does not want us to experience true relationship with God. And if you're at motion night, you know, especially if you've already had already given your life to Jesus, I try to make it just a very simple, clear explanation of why Jesus died for us. Why God loved us so much that he would send Jesus to die for us. But here's the beautiful thing about that gospel presentation, guys. We need to understand it and believe it every single day. I think that's actually been one of my biggest struggles as a Christian my whole life is I've forgotten that Jesus died for me, that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die for me. And I, and I haven't lived my life daily because of that. I've gotten caught up in the things that I see right in front of me, the struggles I have, the frustrations, my own sins. And because of that, you know what Satan has done with me? He's kept me on the fence. And anytime I feel like I'm moving toward God, Satan tries to do things to keep me on the fence. The struggle can become very real with that. So us, believers, followers of Jesus, There's a beautiful way for us to understand how to go all in. And I want to talk to you guys about an example in the Bible that talks about going all in for Jesus. You guys know this. um, Jesus told um, stories. He told parables. Uh, if, If you haven't ever read the Bible a lot or if you've struggled reading the Bible, pick up a Bible tonight. When you go and pick up a Bible throughout the week, try to go beyond just the Bible app on here because then you'll be distracted by other things. Pick up your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, come see me. Come see Silas. Come see one of your leaders. We'll get you a Bible. Immediately, we'll get you a Bible. And start reading in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Read about what Jesus taught because Jesus told things in stories. He told things in parables so we could understand what Jesus was teaching. He told this, this this parable in Mark 10 about the rich man. So I want to read you guys this story and hopefully we can all relate with it together. So check out this story in Mark 10, verse 17 to 25. It says this, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him and he knelt, in, he knelt down and he asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commands, all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's even easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person 
to enter the kingdom of God. So this story starts out with somebody who has a lot, right? He was rich. That means he had power. He had influence. And I love that at the beginning of this story, how does it, how does it say that this man went to Jesus? What did it say that he did? Was he just strolling along and just like chilling out up in a tree like Zacchaeus? Or what did he do? What did he do, guys? He ran. Thank you. He ran. And he didn't only run to Jesus, he knelt before him. Why would he do that? Respect, right? He put himself lower than Jesus. And on top of that, he ran to Jesus, he knelt in front of him, he called him good teacher. I was doing some research about this. This, uh, this term, good teacher, I'm calling it that, was only something that the rabbi only the people that were closest to God that could be in God's presence in the Holy of Holies, that, that was only a term that the rabbi would refer to as, as the Father in heaven, to, to God as. So that term was not used. So this rich man, he, he not only runs and kneels before Jesus, but he uses a, a term, he calls him good teacher that is so holy, that is so reverent. And he asked him, he said, what do I have to do? I want eternal life. I want to live with you forever. Jesus responds with a question. I love how Jesus does that in his stories. He responds with a question. And I think, I think with that question, you know, Jesus is saying, he, he says, um, he says do you, why do you call me good? Because he called him good teacher. And I think Jesus is asking that because Jesus is, he's, he's digging deeper because he, he, th- he knows this man's on the fence. He's saying, why do you call me good? Do you understand who I am? Do you understand why I came? How much I love you? The man's asking this question, what do I have to do? Does that sound more like faith or more like works? Faith or works? Works. He said, what must I do? What do I I have to accomplish? What do I have to prove? What things do I have to check off the list? What good things do I have to do for me to earn that? Jesus says this. Jesus says, you know, you know the commandments. He said, you can't murder. You can't commit adultery. You can't steal. You can't lie. You can't cheat anybody. Honor your father and mother. Why does Jesus use all of these Commandments. Why does he use all these examples? I mean, imagine if people lived by those examples today. What would how good would the world be? How much would people be focused more on Jesus if the world followed those commandments? I believe these were commandments that Jesus knew was like those are how you treat people. That those commandments are 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 ways that you show that you follow God. And the man and the man he said, teacher. Called him teacher again. He says, I've obeyed all these since I was young. He said, I've done the right things. I've followed the, the book. I've lived by the law. I haven't broken the commandments. And in this moment, it says that Jesus, it's almost like it's, it time stops. It says that Jesus felt a genuine love for the man. He says he looked at him. He felt a genuine love for him. And he said, hold on, there's one thing you haven't done. There's one thing you haven't done. And it's this, Jesus said, go. He said, sell all that you have. Give all your money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. After you do that, then you can follow me. But remember, this is the rich man. What was his life made out of? It was made out of riches about what he had, about his his status. But even then, he followed all the commandments. Similar to like the Pharisees, he did, he did everything right. He didn't have this sin over here. He didn't have this thing that was bad over here. He didn't have these things that people knew about. And they were like, man, like, dude, there's no way you're going to go to heaven. By the book, by the way that people looked at what it looked like to follow God, he, he did everything right. And Jesus says, there's one, one thing you have to do. He says, you got to go sell everything you have. You got to sell everything. You gotta sell everything you have. 
It's in this moment that you, you already know that this is where the man stops. It says in the scripture, it says the man's face fell. It's almost like he was so full of life. He was so full of excitement, so full of joy because he was with Jesus. And he's like, man, I'm so close. What do I got to do? What do I got to do? I've done all those things. And then Jesus hits him, man, you got to give up what you have. All that stuff that's yours, all that stuff that you, you've earned. Jesus says, man, go and go get rid of it. Sell what you have. Follow me just like Jesus, the way he called his disciples. And the man Stops and it says that his face fell. It says that his face fell. He went away sad for he had many possessions. Why would he go away sad? He had many possessions. He could have just done what Jesus said. He could have just given it up, right? But what did he have to do to go on the other side of the fence? He had to stop seeing life like this. He had to stop me and say, man, I, I got to do this. I got to do these commands. I got to do it. another thing. Jesus says, I got to do this. But Jesus says, actually, look at me. Just get rid of everything you have. And when Jesus talks about money, when Jesus talks about possessions, the, thing you, the things you have, it's, it can be controversial. Some people think different things about it. I, I don't believe that Jesus wants us to have nothing in this life. I don't believe that Jesus doesn't want us to have things that we're blessed with, but it's the heart of the matter. This man, his heart was still in what he had and what he needed to do physically, what he needed to do to earn it. And so when Jesus said, actually, you gotta let go of it all. If you're gonna focus on me, if your eye's gonna be toward me, if you're gonna take the ladder and not just be on the fence, he said, you gotta let go of what you have. So the man, his face falls. He goes away sad. And then Jesus looks around and he says, why is it so hard for someone who's rich to enter my kingdom? It says the people that were listening, the, the disciples were amazed. And, and it was so important what Jesus was saying, guys, that he said it again. And he didn't just say it again the same way he said, dear children. He was like bringing it down to their level. He's like, hey guys, listen to this. Don't miss this part. Jesus says, it's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. It's very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Why did Jesus use that analogy. I mean, a camel during that time was like one of the largest animals around. And then you have a needle, so you, the tiny, you got this huge contrast. And Jesus is drawing this example because on our own, on the rich man's own accord, guys, he couldn't do it. That's why he became sad, that's why he walked away, that's why he left that feeling deflated, feeling empty, feeling at loss because of what he had, because Jesus said, man, this is impossible for you to do alone. You have to do this by having faith. You have to do this by having faith in me. And so here's the question I have for you guys to finish up tonight. For the rich man, it was his possessions. It was everything he had built his life on. Even though he was a good person, he followed God's law. His heart was still distracted. My question for you is, what are the things in your life right now that keep you on the fence, that keep you on the side where the devil has his grip on you? I got, a, I got a basket full of stuff, guys. Some of the people that, I, that I'm closest to in my life know the things that keep me on the fence. They know the things that I struggle with as often as I can, I, I try to get them to be, you know, to call me out on that. But ultimately, I got to make that decision because there's things that the devil uses to keep me on the fence. There's things I, I cared about too much. There's things I'm too focused on. There's things that, that I have with my own sin struggles that you guys have those things too. But like the rich man, we don't admit that. 
like the rich man, we think all too often that we just have to make a declaration. We've got to get baptized. We've got to be in church. We've got to not say this or that. We, we don't talk about our addictions. We don't talk about our lies. We don't talk about our sexual sins. We don't talk about our own greed for being rich, for having that status. Whatever that thing is in your life or it's multiple things or something else, it's always gonna keep you guys on the fence. Like I have a barbed wire fence behind my house. It drives me nuts. Like I need to build a privacy fence because I'm like, why do I have barbed wire? Um, I guess I'm a city person now so I'm saying a, a barbed wire fence drives me crazy. Um, but I have a barbed wire fence like 15 feet by my house. I wanna build a, a, a regular fence, like a wood fence right there to, to block that. But it's because, like, if I'm ever working over there or going into the woods behind it, like, I can get caught on that fence, right? Anybody ever been caught up in barbed wire fence before? Something? It's not fun, okay? It's not fun. Um, I think about that when I thought about this, this message. That fence, it's, it's almost, it's like barbed wire. It catches us. And that thing that's on that fence that Satan uses to catch you, that's something you gotta deal with. That's something just like the rich man you got to deal with. And ultimately, you got to make a call. Are you going to go to God? Are you going to take that ladder to him? Are you going to stop saying, man, I'm, I just I can't make it over the fence. I, I'm just going to keep this to myself. I'm not going to abandon this sin, I'm, this addiction, this problem, this person, this drama, whatever it is. All of us in some way or another have something like that or have it presently in our life. But the question that I want you guys to, to take with you to groups is what are you gonna do about that? Dear God, thank you for tonight for the um, time we've had together. I pray that uh, everybody's times in groups would be um, really good, God. I pray that um, you know just real life stuff would be able to be shared. Um, I pray, God, that um, the heart that Chaz had behind this message, God, of if we can't live our life on the fence, the place where the devil wants us, where we can be so close to giving it all to you and going all in, but yet Satan just holds us back by the things in our life. I pray, God, that freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, college students, adults, God, I pray that each of us can let go of those things. I pray that we will not walk away from a moment and an experience with you and, and digging into your word and we wouldn't walk away like the rich man sad. Our face wouldn't fall, our life, we wouldn't look and just say, I, I guess I'm just gonna go back to the same thing tomorrow. Would you please protect us, God, from the things that keep us on the fence and I ask those things in your name, amen.